without your slides. Uh, our last speaker in this session is, uh, is, is Jonas Stalin. He is the Vice President of Global Marketing at Absolute. And he's going to be talking about an interesting topic. As consumer landscapes change, how do companies change along with it? And that's his topic. Uh, one interesting thing about his background is that he loves cars, and it takes him to Germany where he races his personal favorites twice every year. I'm glad you're fine and no accidents, nothing. So now for something completely different, as Monty Python would say. Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I just flew in from Sweden. I probably got up a little more than 24 hours ago. So if I stop making sense, I apologize for that. I'm going to try to stay as, as sharp as I can. <laughs> no, no, no. Not yet. Not yet. Perhaps later tonight. Uh, okay, so thanks for having me. Uh, you know what? One of the things that can sometimes frustrate me with, with talks is, is, is when people come in and, and, and they make the, what they've done look really easy. I think most of us in this room know that business decisions are usually really complex and complicated and subtle. Um, in medicine, I don't know if you know this, there's this thing called grand rounds where doctors can actually look back and analyze the treatment of a patient after the fact. Uh, yet in business, there's no such thing other than maybe the court of public opinion or business uh, cases from places like this. Uh, well, today what I want to talk to you about is uh, transformation. I think transformation is something that's relevant to everyone. Uh, transformation is something that's surrounding all of our brands and businesses. And even if what you're doing is static, transformation is happening around you. Um, in the words of, uh, of Ferris Bueller, Life moves pretty fast, and if you don't stop and look around once in a while, you might miss it. Uh, in other words, it's about either changing, embracing change, or letting change happen to you. I think a lot of companies out there, they let change happen to them. We certainly did, uh, and that's the story I want to tell you about today. I want to tell you about a very iconic brand in transformation. I'm going to pull back the kimono. I'm not just going to talk about our successes, but I really want to share as well some of the failures and the challenges um, uh, that we've had. Uh, but first, I thought we would do a little bit of a history lesson, if you'll bear with me. I don't know how much you know about Absolute Vodka, but I think some context might be helpful. So I'll take you back to Sweden in 1979. Uh, back then, the Swedish spirits industry was actually a monopoly called Wien and Sprit which means wine and spirit, VNS for short, and it was owned and run by the government. Now the revenues of VNS, and we had quite a lot of revenues because Swedes like to take a drink every now and then. A lot of, these revenues, they actually went to cover social services. Uh, and one of the bureaucrats in VNS, he thought, why don't we try to export our spirits and we'll increase these revenues even more. So it's a very kind of, of entrepreneur, entrepreneurial civil servant called uh, Lars Lindberg. Now, uh, it's a pretty, pretty bold idea. You know, you're going to take a, a Swedish spirit and, and take it abroad. Uh, one of the spirits he had in mind was a very premium spirit that's made in a very small village in southern Sweden. It has less than 10,000 inhabitants, and almost all of those 10,000 inhabitants are somehow involved in the making of this vodka. Uh, it's all sourced from within a 50-mile radius, all the ingredients. Uh, that place is called Aarhus, and that's actually the place where I started out from uh, this morning. And the brand is called Absolute, which is actually short for absolutely pure vodka, if you didn't know. And it is a very pure vodka. Uh, so, what's the place you think you want to go if you want to export Swedish vodka? It's here. This is where the business is. This place has almost 50% of the global contributive margin of vodka, if you believe it, because it's a very advanced vodka market. But coming to America is not always an easy thing. You know, There's a bunch of challenges associated with coming to America. I'll, I'll mention a few of them. First of all, uh, back in 79, all of you guys thought that good vodka came from the Eastern Bloc. Uh, and to convince you that Swedish vodka was a good fit thing was not necessarily easy. Uh, this was the competitive set at the time. 
kind of ugly looking bottles with big labels that was just hiding the product behind them. Uh, that's what it looked like then. And the category was not very premium, but we wanted to sell this vodka expensively. This is what the category looked like. Not entirely premium, quite cheap. Win a Russian bride, I think it says. <laughs> I never even thought of burning my bra until I discovered Smirnoff. That was the competitive context at the time. Yeah. It was a little bit challenging. Um, we had to break conventions. We tried to go and see distributors, but no one wanted to take us on board. You know, they really didn't. Uh, we, th we knew that we had to do things differently, and we started with a bottle design. This design is actually inspired by a Swedish old apothecary bottle. It's a clear design. It doesn't have any label. Uh, and testing showed that it was going to be a complete disaster because it disappears in the back bar. If you don't have a label, you can't really see it. And bartenders hated it because the neck is so short that you can't really pour out of it well. Uh, but it's a very authentic Swedish design, and it kind of lets the product uh, inside uh, shine through. Um, the second thing, then, is to find a distributor for the product. And the only guys in town that would carry us is a company called Carillion Distributors. It was a very, very small outfit. Uh, and, and they only had one real sales guy. It's this guy. He's a French guy called Michel Roux. Uh, and they somehow, we've somehow convinced them that they should carry Absolute. So if we summarize the situation here, we're trying to import the Swedish government, I should say, is trying to, to sell Swedish vodka to you guys uh, using a clear glass bottle that's invisible in the back bar, that bartenders hate, using a one-horse distributor with a Frenchman in charge and trying to do all of that at a premium price. <laughs> it doesn't sound very promising, does it? Uh, and in fact, the research we conducted confirmed that it was going to be a complete disaster. Uh, it really did. This is, everything I'm telling you is true. It's a complete disaster. However, uh, the guys who paid for the research were the distributor. And the owners of the distributor told this guy, Michel Roux, they said, Michel, can you at least go out and try to sell enough cartons so that we can get the $80,000 back that we spent on the research? Uh, and that's what Michel did. And he discovered that he was actually able to sell this quite easily, and he got really excited and decided that America needed a proper introduction of absolute vodka, and so he started to go to a bunch of advertising agencies to get the best campaign. Out of that came an agency that produced probably, I would say, one of the most iconic advertising campaigns of all time. Uh, the agency was TBWA, and they were going to collaborate with us for more than uh, 35 years. Uh, and here was another way of, of changing the rules. Instead of talking about what was inside the bottle, TBWA came up with a brilliant idea of just using the bottle as a canvas for art. And the rest, as they say, uh, is, uh, is history. Um, I think for all of you uh, who sort of grew up going to college in the 80s and the 90s, I can imagine that quite a few of you would have had some of these ads on the poster of your dorm rooms. Uh, and, you know, Absolute really became part of, of, uh, of popular culture. And in the beginning of the 90s, Absolute completely dominated and owned the premium vodka category uh, to the extent that it became the largest uh, imported spirit into the United States. Okay. I remember that part. Um, now. So it, it was looking pretty good. But I'm going to talk about transformation. And I said I was going to talk about change. And that happened to us. Uh, like, any, uh, you know, like any habit, it gets old. And the world changed. Uh, in the early 2000s, we had done more than 1,000 of these ads in our archives. And it was starting to become a little bit like wallpaper. And the category was starting to become bling. A guy called Sidney Frank came up with an idea, which is, let's import a vodka from France, tell people that it's filtered through champagne limestone. I still haven't figured out what good that would do. But then you put another $20 on the price point, you put it in a tall and frosted bottle, and all of a sudden, super premium vodka was invented. And then a guy like 
P. Diddy, or Puff Daddy, I think he was at the time, became the ambassador for a vodka made out of grapes. And everyone else who's looking in at this fantastic business, which is vodka, they're throwing themselves at it. There's marshmallow fluff vodka. Or how about a bacon-infused vodka? How does that sound? And the change didn't stop there. In 2006, Sweden got a new government elected. It was the first time we had had a conservative government in many, many years. At Sweden is typically a socialist country, if you didn't know. This, this conservative government didn't understand the benefit of having a government run a global iconic vodka business. And they may have a point, to be honest. So they decided to privatize to sell Absolute, and in, in, the, in the bidding uh, that came after that, the winner was Pernod Ricard, a French spirits company that bought Absolute Vodka for the tidy sum of $9 billion, which basically eroded the Swedish national debt, by the way. Uh, thank you to Mr. Rue and Mr. Lindmark uh, for that. Uh, and boy, was that a cultural change. Uh, I lived through this um, with, with the business. We used to go and tell the government once per year how much money they were going to make that year. And whatever sum we said, they were incredibly happy. <laughs> what the <laughs> now, what they didn't really know was that they could have made three times as much. But you know, no one thought to ask. And we could just go back to our business of trying to have the ultimate strategies, the coolest collaborations, and the best marketing possible. Um, and that's exactly what we did. But the owners, having paid $9 billion, as you can imagine, they're looking for a return. And you know, the business wasn't doing badly. We were growing in sort of like low middle digits, you know, sorry, low, low single digits, which is not bad if you are the market leader in a mature category. Outside of the US, we were growing double digit. Not like back in the 80s and 90s, which was just explosive, ridiculous growth, but decent growth. But what that growth was masking was the fact that the vodka category had transformed and that our fans had actually started to leave the category and that there was a new bunch of consumers entering who didn't know about our collaboration with Andy Warhol, about Keith Haring, about Basquiat, about Tom Ford, about Jean-Paul Gaultier, and that we were personally partying with all of these guys at Studio 54. <laughs> uh, and you know what? I don't think they much cared either, to be honest. So, it's a bit of a drastic image, but you know, it's, it's a deflated balloon. That's the thing about change. It will happen to you, you know, even if you're running an iconic vodka brand. The challenge is you're, you're growing and you think you're doing well, but change can and will happen. So what I want to do for the rest of, of, of my time here with you today is share with you in all humility kind of like the, the four lessons that we've learned through this journey. Uh, and that may be applicable as you're thinking about your businesses in terms of how you can actually take change on board and make something positive and drive change instead of being a, a victim of change. Um, the first change I want to talk about, uh, or the first advice that I want to give is, is, is this. Uh, don't look for canneries in a coal mine or burning bushes. Look for trends. Um, I don't think that this is a new concept. And, and, and being here, I actually have something that I would say about General Motors, which is one example. You know, they had more than 50% share in the 70s, went down to 35 share uh, a decade later, uh, which would be a catastrophic performance for anyone. But I guess the point was that they still had such a dominant position, and the change was so gradual that nobody really took this this uh, threat that was coming with the Japanese automotive industry and later the Korean one very seriously. Uh, and the result was obviously this one. In Sweden, we're hockey fans, and we would probably call that a reverse hockey stick. Um, and it's the same thing with Absolute. You know, it was really the same thing with Absolute. Um, back then, and now we're in the mid-2000s, uh, uh, if you look at volume and if you look at market share, we were doing pretty well. But again, you had this new group of consumers who were coming in, and they weren't buying into the brand in the same way, but I don't think people really wanted to realize it. Market share and volume are not leading indicators. 
they're never leading indicators of business performance. But I think other things are. I remember my sister, this was back in 2003, my sister was reading a book by Candace Bushnell. You know this, this lady who wrote Sex and the City? This was one of her follow-up books. I don't recall the name now, but I so vividly recall my sister telling me this passage from the book. And this was before my, my absolute days. And she said, it was about this girl from Ohio who moved to New York. So moves to the big city and goes out with this cool city girls and they go out to a bar and this girl from Ohio orders an absolute martini thinking that that was a cool thing to order. And the other girls around her are looking like her like she's from Mars. Like that was the uncoolest choice that she could possibly make. And I remember this because I felt so hurt as a Swede. For me, you know, I was even working for the company, but how could there possibly be anything cooler than drinking Absolute? That was in 2003, and it took my company 10 years to react. And why is that? Well, because our business in Ohio remained terrific during those 10 years. It really did. New York might have been a bit more competitive, but Ohio was great. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two, don't try to pursue the really hot stuff. Try to pursue and try to connect your product to how people really use it. It's really easy as a marketeer to try to want to do really cool stuff to get consumers to buy into your brand, to give your brand momentum. It's a very simple thought, but it's also a simplistic thought. Because just because it's cool doesn't mean that it's insightful. It doesn't mean that it's useful. And I'm going to bring up an example, and, and David, uh, an alumni here, he might cringe. He also works for the Absolute Company. He might not even agree with what I'm going to say. Uh, but I don't think these talks are about, is about patting yourself on the back for all the good things that you've done. So I'll bring it up as an example. A couple of years ago, in an effort to reconnect with this new generation of consumers, we decided to go back to what we do really well, which is collaborations. Only instead of having uh, somebody draw our bottle in an artistic way, we wanted to collaborate on music, and not any kind of music, electronic dance music, EDM. Uh, you might not know what it is unless you go to Ibiza every August, but, but it's, it's electronic dance music, and the specific band that we collaborated with were none other than Swedish House Mafia, if you know them. Uh, Swedish by nature, just like we are. And what we asked them to do was, we wanted them to help us uh, write a soundtrack to a famous cocktail, and we chose the absolute Greyhound. A Greyhound is vodka and grapefruit juice, very simple. So we would create this fantastic inspirational landscape around cocktails, and Swedish House Mafia were brought in to provide the soundtrack. Let's have a look at how that turned out. <laughs> Do I press again? Cool. We're going to need volume, a lot of it. pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> I'll tell you what, that is probably, no, it's actually the most watched music video collaboration, and I, I'll tell you, it is the most watched Spirits commercial ever made. So I should be pretty proud about that. But I actually think it was a waste of time. I do. Because, you know, as much as people watched it, they didn't understand the concept behind it. We didn't tie the product and the consumption into that music video. The way it was actually perceived by consumers, and this is what drives me mad, is they thought it was Swedish House Mafia's video and that we had put product placement into it. <laughs> Can you believe? It was my video. I just let them do the music. In the end, I think we did more in promoting Swedish House Mafia in that video than we did in promoting Absolute. And I think that's the learning. Just because it's cool doesn't mean it's insightful.
You agree, David? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, learning number three. Don't be static. Experiment and experiment endlessly. That would be lesson number three uh, that I would give. In the 90s, uh, and I remember, I went to business school in the, in the 90s, you talk a lot about positioning. You take a position and then you try to own and defend that position. Well, I just don't think that that's so true anymore. I think that you should spend less time trying to defend a position and more time trying to invent new business models and new ways of doing business. Um, it's not to say that the brand management school that I learned during my years at P&G was useless. Not at all. I think that still serves me very well. What I mean is that I think any brand today has to act at the speed of the internet, which means that you have to iterate constantly. And at Absolute, that's what we're trying to do. We're really always trying to be in beta mode with whatever we do. And we're looking at the world as our testing ground. We've launched a new campaign platform for Absolute called Transform Today. It puts transformation actually at the very heart of what the brand means. So for the urban creative millennials who we think are our target group, we're inspiring them to create their future. They don't want a nine to five job. They don't want a house in the suburbs, a Volvo, a dog, and all of those things. They want to shape a better future. And with Transform Today as a campaign platform, we're inspiring them to create that future. That could be with you know, doing, uh, um, for instance, graphic novels through Facebook with graphic novel artists. It's about doing hackathons together with them where we're trying to reinvent the future bar experiences. It's about, it's about doing global experiential platforms together. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, and more important than anything, I think this idea that you know, repeatability is the most important thing is no longer true. We think the key thing is to have a point of view a social point of view, and then letting that point of view express itself in many, many different ways. Um, fourth and final lesson, one of my favorites. Uh, this lesson and this learning suggests that you should not be afraid of cannibalization. You should sacrifice yourself to thrive. So what do I mean by that? Well. When you're in a bis you know, when you have a position of success, when you're in a powerful position, it's sometimes disintuitive to change. You sometimes just don't want to do it. But change is happening all around you. So you can either change or let it happen to you. The perp what we're trying to do in the absolute company is just to throw ourselves out there, throw ourselves into the wind and try to change. We're actually launching new brands, not just absolute anymore. We're launching new brands. One of those brands is our vodka. Our vodka is a brand where we go into cities around the world and we build micro distilleries in those cities and then we hand the keys over to local entrepreneurs. The only thing that stays the same is our product and the recipe and then we just relinquish control and say good luck to you. And they get 20% of the profits for the effort. That's what we do. Uh, we built an Our Berlin, we're opening Our Detroit, we're opening Our New York, we're opening Our Seattle, we're opening Our LA, we're opening Our Miami, Our Johannesburg, Our Cape Town, our, our Melbourne, oh, let's watch a movie. You'll see what I mean. Our vodka believes in local power. We believe that things don't have to be done in a certain way just because they've been done like that for a long time. Our vodka is a micro-distilled vodka made by local people. It's locally produced, hand-bottled and engaged in our community. We are all partners running the distilleries in each our own city. First we opened in Berlin. And now we are in a number of cities all around the world. All our vodka is made with the same recipe. But every distillery will use locally sourced ingredients. The small bottle with the crown cap is about keeping things simple. It just stands out. And it reminds us that sometimes simple is beautiful. But more importantly, it's more than vodka. It's about community. It's about people. And it's about going back to work and having purpose. The city adds everything to our vodka. Without the cities, our vodka is nothing. It's truly a family.
Okay. Um, and thank you. I'll tell you what, when the team brought that to me, I thought it was a terrible idea at first. I really did. A big company like Pernod Ricard, going to try to be entrepreneurial, open up distilleries everywhere, just sounded like a really bad idea. And then, by the way, giving away the keys to people that we have no control over. It doesn't sound smart, but it's a breakthrough business model, and I think that could be very, very successful going forward. This is another one. We finally convinced the company to do a better vodka than Absolute. It's Absolute Elix. Uh, this is handcrafted in 1921 copper pot still. It's a much more expensive variant of Absolute. Just won the, the, uh, 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 an award, which is the world's best vodka and the most prestigious spirits competition. It's very expensive, very good. Uh, the point about all of these things, we're also launching businesses, by the way, adjacencies business into nightlife, uh, into entertainment. And I guess the key point of all of that is this. I think several of these things, might fail or they might underperform, but it doesn't matter because we're failing upwards, because we're trying new things. And I think that's a key difference. And at the end of the day, many of these businesses will probably generate more growth for us than absolute vodka ever will again. But you know what? I think that's okay. Um, I'm running over, I see. How quickly do we want to close? Pretty soon. All right. Here's very clear. Thank you. Uh, why don't I go to the closing then? Why don't I go to the closing? Uh, maybe I'll just you know leave you with with uh, with with. Uh, um, I'm going to skip that video. Maybe I'll just uh, I'll just leave you with a slide and, and, and a closing remark because I'm I'm, I'm over time. Uh, the key thing, what I'm trying to say is this, I guess. I believe that every one of us should be in the iteration business because I think the only real competitive advantage going forward is our ability to manage change. And change is inevitable. You can just choose whether it happens to you or if you instigate change. And that, I think, is, is the only constant. Thank you.